chance of a royal winner today in the Queen's Vase with Estimate. And here comes the royal procession. And Kate, a scene as, as those pictures from 1953 prove that has changed so little over the years. So little. It could be all over the same, except that, you know, they're just looking just a tiny bit younger there. And that marvellous year, 1953, year of the coronation, the great year of triumph for Elizabeth. She was the most incredibly popular queen. And, of course, the news on the same day as her coronation, the news came through that Edmund Hillary had conquered Everest. And it seemed to the people in 1953 we were unconquerable. So there was some great fancy dress at the time. There was quite a lot of Everest fancy dress, people dressed up as TV sets, so I, I like to imagine that quite a few of the hats at Royal Ascot would have been a couple of Everest hats as well. And the Queen, as we can see there, wearing a heather wool crepe dress with matching coat and hat, all of those by Angela Kelly, and joined in the first carriage by His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, and also Mr Christopher Rees-Jones and Mr Alistair Bruce, Christopher Rees-Jones being the father of the Countess of Wessex. Of course, and it, you know, it's very interesting because often the media comment on the presence of the Middletons, but they don't often come to the fact that, that the, the parents of Sophie Rees-Jones are often in the procession. They're clearly very good friends of the Queen, and it's marvellous to see them there, no rain, and the Queen doesn't need a... She had this marvellous umbrella yesterday, didn't she, this mint umbrella. Today she doesn't need a purple umbrella, let's cross our fingers so she can get to the end without some rain. In the second carriage we find the Queen's first cousin, Prince Michael of Kent, along with Princess Michael of Kent, Sir Michael Rake, who is chairman of BT Group, and his wife Caroline, Lady Rake. Hanging hard to their hats there. And Prince Michael's father was Prince George, Duke of Kent. Yes. So he is the Queen's cousin. So it, it, they, they have a very long relationship with the Queen. She is very fond of him and has a very long relationship. Princess Michael herself said he shared the same speech coach as her father, King George VI, as was, as was shown so brilliantly in the King's speech. In the third carriage, we have on the far side there in the pale blue, that's Lady Carolyn Warren sitting opposite her husband, John Warren, and closest to us, Mr. and Mrs. Harry Leg Burke. And Harry, a former Welsh Guards officer, now works in the city, his wife, Iona. And Harry, obviously, Tiggy Leg Burke was an yes. extremely yes. influential as. as uh, Prince William and Prince Harry grew up very, as they uh, they, devoted, she, they were really devoted to her. And of course she'll be someone that Prince William was thinking of yesterday in his 30th birthday, that great milestone. So Prince William next on his way to 31. So it's really so great to see. I mean, the first time the Queen came to Ascot was in 1945. She was a 19-year-old. And really, after being really shut away during the war at Windsor Castle, being really quiet, being really restrained, it was her chance to burst out onto the world. Really, uh, just over a month after the declaration of the end of the war, VE Day on the 8th of May, it was an incredible moment for her. And really, the war was at the end of the war. She was in the ATS. She was working as a mechanic, driving her own car. She was becoming a new woman. In the fourth carriage, we find the Honourable Edward Tolomosh, who was in the Royal Procession yesterday as well, and his wife, and also Mr and Mrs Johan Rupert. Gainer is the name of Mrs Rupert. And Johan Rupert is a South African business tycoon. He's chairman of the Swiss-based luxury goods company Richemont and the South Africa-based company Rembro, and also chief executive officer of Compagnie Financière Richemont. So continuing the international flavour of the royal procession. And it's so great to see them in the open carriages. I mean, you know, with the, with the terrible rain, I mean, we, we sometimes might think they might be justified in coming in cars. And really the only time, the Queen's been to Royal Ascot every year since 1945. And the only time they've had to come in cars was 2001 because the cars were being stolen for the state opening of Parliament. They used the carriages then, so they had to come in actual cars then. So I think it's really important for her to show herself to the people. For ever since Queen Victoria, monarchs have really wanted to make sure that they're seen because they know that people come here. They want to see the Queen, they want to see the Duke of Edinburgh, they want to see what she's wearing. It's all so much fun. And it's just so terribly important to her that she is that part of the procession and we can see her and there she is, completely shown to us. We can really see that hat and hat and outfit looking resplendent. And I've worked out what, what it is that, that is, I think, making the Duke of Edinburgh laugh or made him laugh yesterday. On our camera, on our car camera, we, we put a top hat and it's oh. decorated differently every day and, and today it's got, you know, different flowers on it. And so they can see it very clear. There it is. You see the. That's our funny can, can top, hat? top hat. That's what's making him laugh. Mm, exactly. We're not allowed to customise our top hats in the morning enclosure, are we? They have to be very plain. I'm glad you're making the cheap laugh. He's, he's got such a great sense of humour. He's always telling him such funny jokes. Keeps everyone entertained. 
So the only people missing, of course, are the corgis. No corgis here for the Queen. We're not allowed to have our dogs here. She's such a, a incredibly fond of horses throughout history, and also of corgis as well. She, you know, her first corgi was bought for her when she was 18, and ever since then, every corgi's been bred from that same one, Susan. And it's interesting, actually, how different monarchs have almost adopted different breeds of dogs. Yes. So Charles I, you know, would either have big, grand sort of wolf hands, or indeed. Well, the King Charles Cavalier Spaniels that and those look like him, and every, yeah. every portrait of him looks like one of those dogs as well. And she's such a her mother was very fond of corgis, and they, they bought them when she was a very little girl. But she's been passionate about them, and they they, they don't always have the best of temperaments. Corgis, they can be a little bit snappy. Don't say honestly, Kate. If you say something they like that, oh, you will me. get no, you will get the wrath of corgi owners. Oh. Pembrokeshire and Cardigan corgi owners bit, everywhere will they, be on to you. They, they have a they marvelous are, no, life. No, they have character. They have character. They, they know what they want. They, they know what they want. They're just Decisive, they're absolutely decisive. And the Queen's Corgis, they have these marvellous baskets that just a bit off the ground. Now, interestingly, we saw Joseph O'Brien walking the course earlier, and he and his father, Aidan, that looks like them, standing out on the course and waving to the Queen as the royal procession passes. And, and uh, a fantastic spot, actually, to watch the royal procession in relative peace and quiet, get a different view of it, and see the Windsor Greys leading that first carriage. It's very well balanced, the, the carriages. Yes. You know, they have very good suspension. They do, they do. When the, when the Queen was just a little girl, her, one of her favourite games with the governess was pretending either the governess would be a horse or the Queen would be a horse. And if the governess was the horse, the Queen would ride her around, put a saddle on her and make her stop at little places saying they're pretending to be a, a grocer's horse and drop off some bread and drop off some sugar and drop off some flour. And they could do it vice versa. She always loved pretending to be a horse, to ride a horse. So she was just absolutely a horse-mad little girl. And some little girls grow out of being horse-mad and some never do, some never do and the, the Queen is just as fond of horses as she's ever been. And the Queen still rides regularly through, through Windsor Great Park. Had to stop riding for, for a while. She having had a yes, and she used to ride at Trooping the, Trooping the Colour. I mean, she was, was been an incredibly important part of that procession. No longer, of course, but she still is a very skillful rider. And it, it gives her huge amounts of pleasure. And it's, of course, marvellous exercise, as you know so well, Kyle. And as we pointed out yesterday, the Royal Procession takes a different path every day to save the ground. So it's actually on its closest to the grandstand, almost as it can be. Or maybe there's one more path, one more strip it could go across tomorrow and the range is starting to spit but the carriage is still open so that the huge crowd here can get a clear view of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh and indeed of Prince Michael of Kent and Princess Michael of Kent and the and I think it's wonderful carriage. to really remember how it was like for our ancestors to travel in coaches like this I mean of course we're so used to cars the other day when I was coming up to Ascot I was behind the carriage and you actually got it's actually rather slow rings out at the end of the national anthem uh, played by the band of the Coldstream Guards and Ascot obviously a very short journey for the Queen from Windsor Castle but in her 60 years as monarch the Queen has undertaken 261 official overseas visits 96 state visits to 116 different countries it's non-stop it's non-stop being Queen she's our most traveled monarch she has traveled all over the world she really sees herself as the Queen of the Commonwealth and she sees it as so important that she visits continually and she did quite a lot when she was younger and what's, what's the big change of course when, when she was a child is that when her parents went away on their big Commonwealth tours they didn't take her she was at home she was when she was a very little baby but not, not long after she was very, very not even one she was there at home but it's rather different now monarchs when they go traveling they tend to take their children with them 
and on those foreign visits. I think visits. that's really a role that's being taken on now by the younger royals. Increasingly, Kate and William, they're doing the travelling, the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall, they're the ones, they're the ones that are doing the travelling, you know, Cambridge and, and Prince Charles. I think it's become very important for the younger royals to take on that mantle because it is rather exhausting for the Queen to keep up this, this huge pace. And on those foreign visits, um, the Queen has received some interesting gifts two tortoises given to her in the Seychelles in 1972. A seven-year-old bull elephant called Jumbo was given to the Queen by the President of Cameroon in 1972 to mark the Queen's silver wedding anniversary. And two black beavers after a royal visit Jumbo. to Canada. I'd like an elephant. How sweet. My favourite gift ever was given to her on her actual wedding. It was two pieces of burnt toast which was sent to her because two ladies were hearing the, the news and they heard the news of the engagement between Prince Philip and Princess Elizabeth. It was so excited that they, they burnt their toast and they thought they'd better send it in to prove that they were excited. And later on we will see the Queen's colours in action once again, those colours, purple body with gold braid, scarlet sleeves and black velvet cap with a gold fringe. It's never call it a gold tassel, it's gold fringe. And those were colours adopted and inherited from those used by King Edward VII. Yes, he was a great fan of racing. Queen Victoria had some good successes, but really it was Edward VII who really threw his heart and soul into racing. He loved it, he loved the horses, he loved the social occasion, which Queen Victoria didn't because she was a woman for so much of her life. He does absolutely love the celebration, the ladies in their hats, the whole look and has some incredibly successful horses, including Diamond Jubilee, which was born in the year of the Diamond Jubilee, and ran some pretty good races. They won the Derby in exactly. 1900. Exactly. And George And, and going right back to Charles II, I know he was, you know, most of his racing would have been done at Newmarket. Yes. Um, but I suppose that would be one of the earlier instances of of a monarch being really keen on the game. Really keen. I mean, Queen Anne, of course, was the first one because she instigated well, the first one here. Got, the first one here. And the first one to think, you know, I think we should have my own, own special racehorse. And the royal family traditionally have been great riders. Of course, riding was so important for a king or queen in the, in, the, in the old days because that was the way you led into battle. You had to be good at horsemanship. And a very interesting question yesterday came in saying, was Elizabeth the first a good rider? She was marvellous. She was a very skillful rider and that was crucial for a king and crucial for Queen as well. Presumably, Elizabeth I would have ridden sides. Yes, she would have done. She would have done not, not the, not, not, uh, not as we would know it. And she was very skilled, very fast, and very successful. And so, what was once a very important job for a king or queen is now something that's a bit more ceremonial. But I love the fact that our royal family is still so keen on on horses. The uh, Queen herself, her first horse was, was given to her it was a Shetland pony given to her by her grandfather George V, and she called it Peggy. Queen Victoria's first horse was called Dickie the Donkey and was pretty fast, apparently. He used to go round around Kensington Gardens. Dickie the Donkey. Dickie the brilliant. Donkey. Speedy Dickie. So the Queen and the Royal Party and the Duke of Edinburgh there will make their way up to the Royal Box. And actually, this year, for the first time, they have built a box on, on the paddock side of the grandstand. And I saw the Duke of Edinburgh looking down on the runners in the paddock from that from that box it's got a it's got a rather smart front on it let's hope they're going to watch a winner today i really hope so my fingers crossed for estimate and my money as well there's the there's the new area and, and the royal box is on the other side of the grandstand obviously looking over the race course yep. but as everything everything adapts when you realize oh we could do with this you know, they can walk straight across a private bridge and then come out on this side, on the paddock side, and yes. get a really good view of the horses. It's a really good view, and yes, hopefully she'll be watching her win today. Well, she was saying, 50s was really her time, so maybe she'll get it back this in the next decade to come. Kate, thank you so much. Thank you so much Fantastic for having me. Fantastic stuff, and stay and enjoy the racing, won't you? I will. Because Can't I think wait. if there is a royal victory, I really think you should be here well, to I've witness it. Well, I've got some it. money on it. I've got to get my kitchen done. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm going to do with it. Uh, let's focus a little more. Tea Group and his wife Caroline, Lady Rake. Hanging hard to their hats there. And Prince Michael's father was Prince George, Duke of Kent. Yes. So he is the Queen's cousin. So it, it, they, they have a very long relationship with the Queen. She is very fond of him and has a very long relationship.
Princess Michael herself said he shared the same speech coach as her father. Came to the people in 1953, we were unconquerable. So there was some great fancy dress at the time. There was quite a lot of Everest fancy dress, people dressed up as TV sets. So I, I like to imagine that quite a few of the hats at Royal Ascot would have been a couple of Everest hats as well. And the Queen, as we can see there, wearing a heather wool crepe dress with matching coat and hat, all of those by Angela Kelly, and joined in the first carriage by His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, and also Mr Christopher Rees-Jones and Mr Alistair Bruce, Christopher Rees-Jones being the father of the Countess of Wessex. Of course, and uh, Edith George VI, as was, as was shown so brilliantly in the King's speech. In the third carriage, we have on the far side there in the pale blue, that's Lady Carolyn Warren, sitting opposite her husband, John Warren, and closest to us, Mr. and Mrs. Harry Leg Burke. And Harry, a former Welsh Guards officer, now works in the city, his wife, Iona. And Harry, obviously, Tiggy Leg Burke was an yes. extremely yes. influential as, as uh, Prince William and Prince Harry grew up. Very, as they uh, it's very interesting because often the media comment on the presence of the Middletons, but they don't often come to the fact that, that the, the parents of Sophie Rees Jones are often in the procession. They're clearly very good friends of the Queen, and it's marvellous to see them there. No rain, and the Queen doesn't need a. She had this marvellous umbrella yesterday, didn't she? This mint umbrella. Today, she doesn't need a purple umbrella. Let's cross our fingers so she can get to the end without some rain. In the second carriage, we find the Queen's first cousin, Prince Michael of Kent along with Princess Michael of Kent, Sir Michael Rake, who is chairman of B. Chance of a royal winner today in the Queen's Vase with Estimate. And here comes the royal procession. And Kate, a scene as, as those pictures from 1953 prove that has changed so little over the years. So little, it could be all over the same, except that you know they're just looking just a tiny bit younger there. And that marvellous year, 1953, year of the coronation, the great year of triumph for Elizabeth. She was the most incredibly popular queen. And of course, the news on the same day as her coronation, the news came through that Edmund Hillary had conquered Everest, and it seemed.